So when we talk about positive, not just of job opportunities, but usually we also have accommodation, transport infrastructure as a whole. So the whole community benefits based on tourism. If you think about Hong Kong, when we don't have a lot of tourists coming in, we're not going to build such a big airport, right? We're also not going to build so many hotels, so many roads connecting to the airport or railway, subway, like maybe we'll still build it, but the capacity won't be as big. And as a result, maybe the community will not be able to benefit from those. But then if you ask, okay, when there are not that many tourists, probably traffic congestion won't be that of an issue, right? If you look at now, Hong Kong, where we don't have foreign tourists, traffic congestion actually, the situation actually improves. Not a lot, but at least improved. Also factoring the work from home, then if you travel in peak hours, it's actually less crowded and congested on the road <laughs> traffic nowadays. And when we get foreign currency, it means that more money are now into circulation in that economy. So give me an example. If we have no tourists, it is like closed economy. Like for the simple, let's say the economy is only two of us, only you and I. So I buy things from you with my money, right? And you buy things from me with your own money. So let's say we both have $10, okay, maximum. And then if I buy a piece of apple, an apple from you, cost me two dollars okay so now your net worth is 12 mine is eight right because subtract two from me increase two for you right so and then now let's say you have geography lesson with me and then that also costs two dollars so now our net worth is the same 10 again so it means that the total economy is only 20 dollars so okay but then what about we have tourists let's say someone call Mr. A, as a tourist, come to our economy and he bought Apple from you, paying $2 for you. So now your net worth become 12. Mine is still 10, right? Because I don't lose any money. So now the economy has $22 circulating. So it means that when we have more tourists, they bring in foreign currency into the economy and they will consume products and services. So it's a positive to the economy. That's why we say that tourists tends, like tourism tends to be positive for the economy. It drives GDP, right, economic growth, because tourists will spend and consume in that economy. And as a result, local people make money. So another aspect of that would be the addition of foreign currency increase the circulation of the total amount of currency in the economy, right? Just like I mentioned. So another aspect for that would be when the country is in debt, meaning they owe other country money, when we or when the country has tourists bring in foreign currency and they the country can use that foreign currency to repay foreign debt. So example would be if there's country A that owes country B. And that debt is denominated in US dollar. So because it is the reserve currency, meaning a lot of transaction, a lot of trade business are settled in US dollar because it is credible. So people will think that, okay, the is a storehold of wealth, meaning a storehold of value. So if I get US currency, I don't worry that I can't buy stuff tomorrow because it will be still accepted by other people. That's why it's called a reserve currency, meaning most people are willing to use that currency to settle transaction, meaning it is a medium of exchange from economics term. So it means that when country A borrowed money in US currency, but country A is not US, right? So country A cannot print US dollar to repay the debt. Country A can only print local currency, okay? So it means that when country A has to repay the US currency debt, country A has to get some US dollar, right? So it means that country A has to use local currency to exchange 
US dollar. And when there's currency exchange, there will be fluctuation in the exchange rate. Meaning, With the change in exchange rate, it can change the amount of money you need to get a certain amount of US dollar. Could be more, could be less. So then you, it becomes a problem of increasing a debt or reducing it, right? right. But why it has depreciated so much? Because people think that it is worthless to hold Russian ruble. Meaning, people do not transaction, do not carry a transaction in Russian currency. So they think that it is no value holding it. So they sell it to other people in exchange for other currency. And when people sell something, they don't want to hold it, it depreciates in value. Meaning, nobody wants it, right? So if you think about, um, I keep selling you that apple, increasing the supply of it, then eventually, for people to buy, I have to lower the price for it to be attractive enough for people to buy, right? It's like, right? we live in a world of scarcity. So the more scarce something, the higher the price usually, right? If you think about why limited edition are usually more expensive than normal edition, because it's limited, meaning there's a fixed number of items available for that. So usually, right? So if you think about like why Ferrari or Lamborghini are so expensive, like on one hand, like the design looks good, like performance are good, but also because they have a relatively limited production every year. So in order to get one, you have to pay a higher price to get it. So that's why usually handmade are usually more expensive because when it's handmade, you cannot mass produce it. So it limits the quantity of supply. That's why the price go up. But getting into economics, but back to Russia. So when people are no longer holding Russian currency, it depreciates because people don't want to get hold of it. They just want to sell it. So in order to have for buyers, because in the market, we need both buyer and seller for a transaction to take place. When there's a buyer, but there's no seller, there will be no transaction and vice versa. When there's seller, but no buyer, nobody's going to do the transaction. So for the seller, in order to make a sale, it has to reduce the price so that buyer will be willing to buy it at a lower price if it is not that good. Right? But if it's good, the seller can increase the price and the buyer will still be willing to buy it. Right? Yeah. So long way, long story short. So when we have more tourists, we get more circulation of foreign currency. So and usually the government, country A, may also get US dollar from US or other tourists, right? Because if the tourists bring US dollar to the country A and spend, or maybe just go to the exchange like shop and exchange US dollar for that local currency in order to consume, then it is increasing the foreign currency reserve in that country. So give me an example. Have you been to Mohim Lot Yun? Yeah, so you need to use real currency, like Hong Kong dollar, to exchange for a certain amount of token in order to play. So you can think of it that way. So by exchanging real currency for token, you're giving that uh, Mohim Lot Yun money, right? And the Mohim Lot Yun doesn't lose the token because you are spending that token inside the machine, right? inside that place. So at the end, you're adding money to that Mohim Lot Yun. Well, for sure, you get to experience the playing and sometimes you play those toy crane, right? Adding US right. dollar to country A, then country A can now use those currency to be paid for US debt without the need to exchange. So that is a relatively very simplified explanation. So in reality, it not necessarily work in this way because the government don't extract the US dollar directly from the tourists. So it goes through rounds of transactions and banks and other financial institutions. But for you to understand, at this level, that would be enough. Government tax revenue, obviously it would be good for the government, not just for personal income tax, but also business tax, right? So for example, if I run a restaurant, 
targeting tourists. Let's say all you can eat Chinese dim jump, and then the foreigner come to my restaurant and all, eat all they can. So as a result, I make money for the business, right? And then the government will say, okay, Francis, you're making money with the all you can eat dim sum restaurant. So we are going to charge you tax, right? Because we provide you with the security, right? We attract the tourists. So you will have to pay tax. That is inevitable, right? Like three things in life, like death, disease, and tax, you can't avoid. So tax, you can't avoid, especially for the business. There are ways to minimize or to defay but we're not going to get into that because this is not accounting and not illegal tax evasion lesson. So you can you should always consult your profession. Always consult with the professional. Right? I'm not professional in the tax evasion, so don't ask me. <laughs> Negative. We say that dependence and reliance on single sector like tourism would be quite problematic in times like the pandemic. If you think about Hong Kong, but right. tourism would be one one big pillar. And then, so if you think about the whole thing, if you rely so much on tourism, it's like no diversification, right? If you have heavy exposure, let's talk about investment term, heavy exposure of one investment, then when it go upside down, then you're going to lose a lot of money, right? So example would be like Pacific Islands or Indian Islands like Maldives. These are country or small island country relying basically a huge percentage of the GDP or economy on tourism. Like you go to Maldives, what are you going to do? You go to the hotel, you go to swim around, massage, like scuba diving, and that is all tourism based, right? So people, they are mostly employed in the tourism sector. So when there's no tourism available, like the pandemic, then they are going to go belly up, right? Because they lose all the income source. So how can they survive? They can't because there's simply not enough domestic consumption. Like if you ask those people, oh, where do you make money out of it now? Like how do you make a living? They say nothing because there's no tourists. The hotel are not getting money. So the hotel can't pay the employees. When the employee don't get paid, they can't consume, right? Because they don't get a paycheck. Then how do they consume? Because they get no money. No money means other related business, local businesses suffer as a result. So it is a vicious cycle. So give you an example. So now with pandemic, tourism stops. In Hong Kong, tourism related business stop as a result. Let's say Disneyland, uh, a lot of hotels, airline. And when these businesses suffer, they reduce in pr uh, profit, right? So maybe they have to lay off employees because they're no longer needed. Like, what is the point of hiring so many pilots and flight attendants when there's not even flight available? So all these becomes uh, a fixed cost. So for the business to survive, they have to cut costs, meaning they have to lay off the employees because relatively speaking, laying off employees is easier than selling airplanes because it takes a relatively long time and a lot of procedure to find buyers for the airplanes. But laying off the employees are relatively easy compared to, compared to selling airplanes. And obviously compared to shutting down the whole airline, right? So that would be the last resort. And then, so when these people are unemployed, lay off, then they don't get no money for month to month, right? So they have to rely on their savings in the past. So as a result, when they get less money, they're going to consume less, spend less, because they know that they have to rely on the saving. So until they find another job, they have to take money out of their own pocket, right? Basically. As a result, when they reduce the consumption, other related business suffer. For example, restaurant, for example, uh, transportation, for example, like retail. So then as basically the second or even the third consequence, these retail, restaurants, uh, transportation business suffer because a lot of people are consuming less. As a result, they may even have to lay off their own employees in the retail, restaurant, and transportation service. And then more people become unemployed, and more people consume less. 
So you can now see the whole economy is like snowballing because more people get unemployed, right? And as a result, people consume less. The whole economy like weakens. As a result, it becomes problematic, right? Even for the government with less tax revenue. So you can see why um, the economy is bad because it's all interrelated. Like when we talk about the economy, the fundamental principle is one person's spending is another person's income. So with tourists, the tourist spending is the local people's income. So when the tourists are not coming, they're not spending, then local people get no income. And when the local people are not consuming, other local people are not getting their income. Okay? So, yeah, go south basically. Not very good. And then, yeah, economic downturn. Seasonality would be a relatively stable or predictable business cycle because every season is around the same, right? That's why we call it timing, right? Because it's predictable. There's a cycle, business cycle. Like, for example, for a ski resort, you know in summertime it's probably no tourists because there's no snow. Like, how can you ski? But then in the winter time, you get a lot of tourists. So as a result, they probably make a lot of make the money in the winter time, and they basically try to conserve the cost, uh, that basically conserve the business in the summertime to get through it, and then they will make money again. Because usually they do it in the one like financial year, right? So they don't calculate the profit every single month. Maybe they calculate, but then as a whole, they do it annually. Okay. So changing fashions, we talk about the rise of new type of tourism before. So with the rise of new types of tourism, maybe the older types become less fashionable, right? Or less uh, act likable. Right? You know this one? Yeah, cannot act like. So nobody likes then, nobody go. Okay, competition from other areas, relatively speaking, would be uh, substitu substitution. So it means that it's similar. Why go there? So if you want to go to a coastal beach resort, you want to lay down and do sunbathing. And then you can choose from resort A and resort B, and even country A and country B. Let's say you can go to Thailand, you can go to Malaysia, and even within Thailand, you can go to different places. So it means that it is also like the fashion. So when one place is fashionable, people, a lot of tourists go there. But when it becomes less fashionable, then it gets less tourists, right? So that's also competition. Economic downturn, talk about it. Basically, like during that economic years, people consume less. So they're unlikely to travel because they have no money. Why travel overseas, right? Because traveling is a luxury, right? It is not a necessary daily requirement. Like, you won't die if you don't travel, right? But if you don't eat, you will die. So as a result, in economic downturns, when people's disposable income, this word means the remaining money where people can spend without worrying about survival. Meaning after all the bills, all the food, how many money, how much money you can spend. That's called disposable income. So in economic downturns, people's income is reduced, disposable income is also reduced, and travel or other luxury consumption become less likely.